18, verse 20. Srimad Bhagavatam 11, 19, 20 through 24. Om Gyanti Mirandasya Kirajana Salakaya Chaksun Militam Mena Tasmai Shri Gadavena Maha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swam Padantikam Ma Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamane Namaste, sir, is what did they say? Go, Ramani, but you didn't never say Sasunya Mahadi. Pastyatya de Satari de Panchakalpa to Rupis Cha, Kripa Sindhu Pay, but you have a titan, I'm Pavan, a bio, Vaishnava, a bio, no maho, no maha. Jaisi Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda. Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasudhi Gaur Bhakta Vrindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So this verse is spoken by Lord Shri Krishna himself. He gives the summation of what is Bhakti Yoga. What Bhakti Yoga consists of or comprises of in total and he he enunciates that point at the end of his statement sradayam rita katayam me shasva mamanu kirtanam purinishta chapujayam stutibi stavanam mama adaram varicharyayam sarvangair avibandanam Mad Bhakta Puja Bhakti Bhaktika Sarva Bhuteshu Mam Matihi <clears throat> Marm Ate Swanga Chaitasta Cha Vachasa Mad Gunir Nanam Gunir Ranam Mai Arpanam Chamanasa Sarva Kama Vivarjanam Mad Artar Ka Parikya gyo bogasya cha sukasya cha istam datum hutam japtam maratam yalvritam tapaha evam dharma manushyanam uravatma vidvedinam maya sangajate sangjayate bhakti konyor tho swava visifishyate. Krishna is speaking. <laughs> Firm faith in the blissful narrations of my pastimes, constant chanting of my glories, unwavering attachment to ceremonial worship of me, praising me through beautiful hymns, great respect for my devotional service, offering obeisance with the entire body, performing first class worship my devotion, consciousness, I can't see the net word, go up a little bit or down, either one up or down. Consciousness, consciousness of me in all living entities, offering of ordinary bodily activities and my devotional service, use of words to describe my qualities, offering the mind to me, rejection of all material desires, giving up wealth for my devotional service, renouncing material sense gratification and happiness, and performing all desirable activities such as charity, sacrifice, chanting, vows, and austerities with the purpose of achieving me. These constitute actual religious principles by which those human beings who have actually surrendered themselves to me automatically develop love for me. What other purpose or goal could remain for my devotee? Purport. The word Mad Bhakta Pujyadika are significant in this verse. Sayadika indicates superior equality. The Lord is extremely satisfied with those who offer worship to his pure devotees, and he warns them accordingly. Because of the Lord's generous appraisal of his pure devotees, worship of the pure devotees, 
is described as superior to worship of the Lord himself. The words mat artyas yanga chesta state that ordinary bodily activities such as brushing the teeth, taking bath, eating, etc., should all be offered to the Supreme Lord as devotional service. The words vachasad mad gunir nanam indicate that whether one speaks in ordinary crude language or with learned poetic eloquence, one should describe the glories of the personality of Godhead. The words mat artya ta varikya kya indicate that one should spend one's money for festivals glorifying the personality of Godhead, such as Ratha Yatra, Janmastami, and Gora Purnima. Also, one is herein instructed to spend money to assist the mission of one's spiritual master and other Vaishnavas. Wealth that cannot be used properly in the Lord's service and is thus an impediment to one's clear consciousness should be given up entirely. The word bogaishya refers to sense gratification headed by sex enjoyment, and sukasya refers to sentimental material happiness, such as excess family attachment. The word data hutam indicate that one should offer to Brahmanas and Vaishnavas first clad food cooked in ghee. One should offer the vibrations swaha to Lord Vishnu in an authorized sacrificial fire along with ghee and grains. The word japtam indicates that one should constantly chant the holy names of the Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, Mother Swaha, I know you're on, there you're there. You can note the spelling of your name is indicated in this verse, it's S-V-A-H-A. -A. That is the actual spelling of the word Swaha. It's not S-W-A-H-A, -H -A, it's S-V-A-H-A. -H -A. That is found in all of the scriptures, Swaha. So this, um, this uh, verse is, in, is really interesting because Krishna in the, in the, I'm sorry, Srila Rupa Goswami in the Nectar of Devotion uh, mentioned 64 items that make up the process of pure devotional service. Uh, there are 39 that are due and there, the rest 25 are avoiding. So total there's 64 items that make up devotional service. Now what Krishna has done here He's taken those 64 items and condensed it down to 15. So you'll see that there he lists 15 activities here that uh, are the essence of the process of devotional service. And as he says here, uh, what other purpose or goal could remain for my devotee? What is he saying is that Outside of these activities, there's nothing. These make up the whole part of devotional service. So we should take note of these 15. You can read them. You can write them down. You can take each one of them and list the activities that fit as subcategories in each one of these. And then you will start to see in a very clear picture what are the essential ingredients of pure devotional service. And of course, in the purport, the acharyas give us some explanation of some of these activities. Not all are mentioned, but most of them are mentioned. And they take great uh, stress in giving them in a very interesting order. And the first one that is there, it's great respect, or pray, no, I'm sorry, what is that one? Performing first class worship of my devotees. Hmm. Um, Krishna is, it says he's, uh, he's Bhaktivatsal. That's the name of Krishna. He's very much 
inclined to serving his devotees. For him, his devotees means everything. We have many examples in the scriptures. For instance, when the four Kumaras were offended by Jai and Vijay as they were tra traversing through the realms of Vaikuntha and had gone through six gates, now they were going through the final gate, which was the gate that led to the palace of where Lord Narayan was staying. Their goal was to meet Lord Narayan and they were qualified, but somehow the gatekeepers didn't notice that. Seeing these young boys, they thought they were intruders into Vaikuntha and therefore they blocked their passage. The four Kumaras became quite upset <laughs> that they were on their way to see the Lord and they were being blocked by these gatekeepers. And so there was a kind of a, like a, a back and forth discussion. But the four Kumaras became angry and cursed the two gatekeepers to fall to the material world because they said, you don't know, you are here in the spiritual world, but you are acting like a materialistic people. Therefore, you should go there. Um, when Lord Narayan became aware of what was happening at the gate, he immediately came. He didn't even take help from Lakshmi, nor did he take help from Garuda. He came by his own power there in such a hurry knowing that there was some problem with his devotees. And as when he was there seeing the situation, he completely sanctioned the uh, curse given by the uh, poor Kumaras to Jai and Vijay, who later fell to the material world in three births as demons. And they became Harani Kashipu, Haranyaksha, Ravana, Kubakarna, Shishupal, and Dr. Varka. And after three births, they were qualified to go back, but they wanted to stay one more birth uh, to see Lord Chaitanya's pastimes. And then they became Jagai and Madai just to take part in Lord Chaitanya's pastimes. So um, when the Lord saw the altercation at the gate, he, uh, he apologized for his gatekeepers and said that, uh, you know, my devotees are more important to me than myself. I would even, as he used, as the phrase is mentioned, I would even lop off or cut off my arms just to uh, uh, protect my devotees. There's no one more dear to me than my devotees. So here it says here, performing first class worship of the devotee. When we worship the devotee in a first class word and way, that devotee is taking that worship and offering to Krishna himself. It is directly going to the lotus feet of the Lord. And that is the principle of the great devotees. They don't accept anything on their own behalf, but being in the position to represent the Lord in all respects of representation. In other words, whatever they do is, is a reflection of the Lord's desire. And therefore, even when they are worshiped, they give it to the Lord because everything is meant for the Lord. But for the performers of the worship, they should understand that to worship the, pu the pure devotee of the Lord is as good as wor is worshiping the Lord himself. The Lord appears in the material world in different ways. He appears as Srimad Bhagavatam. He appears as Krishna Prashadam. He appears in, as his deity. He appears in his holy name. He appears as his pure devotee, the bona fide spiritual master. So the Lord manifests himself through these different agencies, which are his energies to give his association in the process of pure devotional service to those who practice. And therefore one should worship these items. There's a beautiful statement made by Lord Shiva to Parvati, where he was saying that the worship of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is the highest form of worship. 
but worship of the Lord, worship of things in relationship to the Lord are even higher. Tadiyanam samarjanam, he says. Mm -hmm. Tadiyanam means in relationship to the Supreme Lord. So those things that are in relationship to the Lord, when worshipped, they are even higher than worshipping the Lord, such as uh, the pure devotee especially. And of course, we worship the Lord in the form of Srimad Bhagavatam, his holy name, the deity, Prashat, Krishna Prashadam. And there is one more, and there's six altogether. The last one slips my mind. I think it's Tulsi Devi. When we worship Tulsi Devi, we are actually worshiping the Lord directly through the process of his pure devotee, Srimati Tulsi Maharani. So we get to learn a little bit about how devotional service is executed by understanding how the Lord wants things to happen. And this verse is really quite, it's not one verse, it's actually five verses in one where he narrates everyone. And what does he say at the beginning? First, firm faith in the blissful narrations of my pastimes, hearing and chanting his pastimes, constantly chanting his glories, always looking for opportunities to associate with devotees and taking part in glorifying the Lord, his names, his fame, his pastimes, his entourage. Everything about the Lord is glorious. It manifests itself in the absolute sense of itself. So when you chant that, when you glorify the Lord's name, his fame, his deity, his pure devotee, anything that is of the pure representative of the Lord that constant chanting is pure devotional service, the activity itself. Unwavering attachment to ceremonial worship of me. Then what is the ceremonial worship? What do we do? We offer arti to the deity. So that is ceremonial worship. That arti comes from the scriptures known as Pancharatriki, which is the parallel form of worshiping the Lord along with glorifying the Lord in his name, his transcendental scriptures, his pure devotees. So the ceremonial worship means we should take part in kirtan, in arti, like that, and perform these activities. Praising me through beautiful hymns, the scriptures are saturated with glorifications of the Lord given by the pure devotees. In the Srimad Bhagavatam itself, there are at least 10 to 15 different personalities who offer beautiful prayers to the Lord, such as uh, Prahlad Maharaj, Queen Kunti, the Pajetas, uh, what else? Oh, so many prayers, the prayers by the personified Vedas, uh, the prayers by Lord Shiva, uh, the Srimad Bhagavatam is just practically all, all it is. It's glorification of the Lord by his pure devotees. And if we repeat those prayers in a devotional atmosphere with the desire to offer them to the Lord, that is performing, that is praising the Lord through beautiful hymns. And of course, we have kirtans and various types of Bhajans, that we can worship the Lord and praise him. He says, great respect for my devotional service. Knowing that devotional service is the highest form of activity in the material world. Etavame Velokeshmin, Pumsam Dharma, Smita, Pita, Bhakti Yogo, Bhagavati, Tamnamagraha this verse is spoken by the great Yamaraj himself, where he's saying that in devotional service itself, it is the highest activity within human society. And of course, he goes on to, uh, to extend that principle by saying, with, but within devotional service, the highest activity is to glorify the Lord by chanting his glories in the form of his transcendental names. So understanding the position of devotional service over material activities. Sometimes we think, oh, well, I have devotional service and then I have material activities. And we choose 
to give more importance to our material activities. And uh, we find ourselves, you know, just struggling when it comes to, do, to performing devotional service. If you give complete respect and attention to devotional service, your material activities will automatically fall into place by the Lord's arrangement. A little effort is made in order to maintain yourself. But from my experience, sometimes I see that devotees always opt for material activities over devotional service when it becomes a conflict between the two. They think, oh, material activities, they can't wait, but devotional service can wait. I will get to my devotional service. But what are they saying? Really, I is more important. My material activities are more important. And therefore, in that sense, and therefore they will stay in the material world life after life. They'll maybe get a good situation in the next life again to, to, to uh, engage in material activities. But devotional service is transcendental to everything material. It takes one directly into the association of Krishna. Offering obeisances with the entire body, that is called dandavats. Of course, for ladies, they don't do that. They do it a, a, a uh, more of abbreviated version of the same thing, but the same principle counts here. So offering obeisances with the entire body means also with body, mind, and soul, engaging all of one's attention in offering obeisances. Performing first class worship of my devotees, we mentioned this. Consciousness of me in all living entities. Vidyaya Vinaya Sampane, Brahmi Gavati Hastini, Suni Chaiva Swapakecha Pandita Samadarshanaha. So that verse is very important. It is from the fifth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, verse number 18, where in the, it is mentioned that one who does not see the outer body, but sees the soul in all living entities. And the example is given in the verse, Brahmins, uh, cows, elephants, dog, and a dog eater, outcast, seeing not so much the external body, but seeing that within the heart of that particular form, material form, Krishna, and the living entity are sitting there side by side. That's why all, all living entities are sacred because Krishna is in the heart of all living entities along with the, along with the individual soul. So when we get that, that is actually called transcendental vision. Krishna also mentions that in the Bhagavad Gita when he says, thus, when you learn the truth, You'll know that all living beings are my parts and parcels. They're in me and they're mine. He also says it again, many times, actually. He says it in the, uh, in the uh, 15th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Vamai vamso jiva loke jiva bhuta sanatana masastana andriyani prakriti stani karshati. He says that the, all living entities are belonging to him. They're his parts and parcel. They're in the material world and they're struggling. He also, and then he goes on to say, uh, offering ordinary bodily activities in my devotional service. The example was given in the, in the purport when we brush our teeth, when we take a bath, when we take care of our physical body. It's, uh, that's given as an example for using ordinary activities in devotional service. So we should understand that as devotees, we try to, not to make distinctions between this is material, this is spiritual. We connect everything as a service to the Lord. In other words, taking care of the body requires certain activities that need to be daily performed. So we do that, but we understand this this body belongs to Krishna, it is given to us so we can use it in his service. Therefore, we must take care of it as the property of Krishna. And in that way, we have the consciousness that this is devotional service. Uh, use of words to describe my qualities. In other words, we find in the 
in the uh, scriptures there are many poetic expressions that align oneself in glorification of the Lord. So one can also be very creative and using very poetic words or just words of glorification, eulogies to describe Krishna's qualities. Like sometimes you see that Krishna's face is compared to a, a beautiful full moon and his, uh, his, uh, the nails on his feet and the, the nails on his fingers are considered to be small moons. His feet are compared to lotus flowers. Uh, the redness of the bottom of his feet are considered compared to the, the beautiful rising sun when the sun pervades an all beautiful red color as it rises in the morning. So we see beautiful, beautiful analogies that can be used to glorify the Lord and the different qualities of the Lord, different characteristics of the Lord. Offering the mind to me, this is nice. Uh, the mind is, we were just talking about this today in discussion, how the mind can easily take us away from devotional service. It is chanchala, as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, chanchala, he, no, I'm sorry, Arjuna says, chanchala he mana Krishna, Pramati Balabhadriha Tasyaham Nigaman Maya Vayar Idam Saduskaram. Krishna responds to that, yes, the mind is restless, but if you practice offering your mind to me in devotion, you'll be able to control it and take charge of your mind where your mind reflects the activities of devotional service and not simply the mundane. <laughs> thoughts that constantly flow from into the mind and out of the mind due to our association with this material energy. So offering the mind to me, rejection of all material desires. We're not, the devotee is not interested in trying to fulfill material desires. They give them up. Giving up wealth for my devotional service. Wealth is Lakshmi. Lakshmi sits at the lotus feet of Narayan. If you try to have uh, Lakshmi without Narayan, you get Durga. Durga means death. We have the example of Ravana, who wanted the goddess of fortune, Sita Devi, for himself without any respect for Sri, Sri Ram. And what did he get? He got death personified. So those who who try to enjoy Lakshmi without Narayan wound up becoming, uh, having so many problems in life. Wealth belongs to the Lord. The Lord is known as the Dun He is known as the conqueror of wealth. And he, uh, one of his qualities is that every, all the wealth belongs to him. He is the source of wealth and he is, every all wealth is meant for him. He gives us some wealth in order to maintain our existence in this material world. But being conscious of the fact that it belongs to him and is meant to his for you, his devotional service, means giving up wealth for devotional service like that. Renouncing material sense gratification and happiness. Don't try to become happy. This is what is saying, try to serve the Lord. Don't try to enjoy your senses. Just serve the Lord. If you enjoy, if you engage in devotional service by using your senses, your mind, your intelligence, your body, whatever you have in Krishna consciousness, you will be happy and your senses will be satisfied. But if you try to satisfy your senses separately and look for happiness in the activities you perform, you will be disappointed. Because happiness comes not by your own effort, but by the grace of the Lord. And so not uh, giving up this desire to satisfy the senses and to become happy means that you are situated nicely. Performing all desirable activities such as charity, sacrifice, chanting, vows, and austerities with the purpose of achieving me. So we do that, we give in charity, we perform various sacrifices, chanting, 
you make vows and you accept austerities. These are all meant to achieve the Lord. Lord sums up this. These constitute actual religious principles. And then he further gives the understanding human beings who actually surrender themselves to me automatically develop love for me. So love for Krishna, if you follow these principles and engage in these devotional service, you will automatically develop your love for Krishna. And Krishna confirms that himself in this statement. He's speaking to Uddhava. Although Uddhava's main name is not mentioned in this verse, it's mentioned in the Sanskrit, in the very beginning of the Sanskrit, you'll see the word Uddhava. He's actually speaking to his pure devotee Uddhava. You can go to the top and you'll see the word Uddhava is there in the, in the uh, go down, go down farther, and you'll go down farther and farther. It's there in that verse, Uddhavatma Ivedanam. So he's speaking to Uddhava like that, and you'll see it in the trans, in its, the synonyms, the word for word. As you go down, you'll see it, the translation there. It says, um, where is it? Uddhava, my dear Uddhava. It's there. So it, does, it doesn't mention it in the translation, but you can understand from the word for word that Uddhava is the person who is hearing Krishna speaking this. And Uddhava is the, the pure devotee of the Lord. He's very dear to the Lord. He's practically on the level of... He is almost on the level of the residence of Vrindavan. He is very, very dear to the Lord. And uh, he actually looks like the Lord. The Lord confided in Uddhava in so many ways to give messages to his um, devotees in Vrindavan when Krishna was away and they were suffering from separation from him. He sent Uddhava to pacify them and remind them that Krishna has not forgotten them. He cares about you. He, he, he will be back very soon. So Uddhava is so dear to Krishna that when the residents of Vrindavan saw Uddhava, they actually mistaken Uddhava for Krishna himself because he looks like Krishna also. <laughs> He's Krishna's cousin brother, Krishna's father, uh, Vasudev, has many brothers, and one of his brothers, his name is Deva Varata, I think, and his son is Uddhava. So he's cousin brother of Krishna. Okay. okay, so these are just a very brief synopsis. Study this verse, write down these, these activities, and then think about each one of them, and try to find subcategories for each of the categories and list them and you'll find it's an interesting exercise because you'll learn so much more about what is devotional service like that. Okay, we'll stop here. Hare Krishna. Thank you Maharaj for this beautiful verse. I request devotees, if there are any questions, comments, realizations, please go ahead. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisance. Oh, glory, Sushila Prabhupada, all glory to you, Lord of Spirit. Um, Guru Maharaj, can I ask one question here? That um, we can perform all the devotional service to Krishna and that we give us the benefit. But um, if we do some good work in this material life, helping others, or, you know, sometimes doing some charities in the orphanage and stuff like that, will it be counted as? Will we be getting any benefit from Krishna for that as well, or is it not actually advised? 
Well, it says in the Shastras that the highest welfare work you can do for anyone mm -hmm. is to engage in devotional service or bring them to devotional service. That is the highest welfare work. These welfare work activities that are done in the material world actually bring us to Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. But they are not devotional service themselves. They're in, they're in the mode of goodness, they're pious activities. Okay. So there are, if we just concentrate on devotional service, we just like it's mentioned that uh, we sing that we say that prayer every day. Om Gyanti Mirandasya Gena Jena Salakaya Chaksa Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Sri Guru Venu Maha Sri Chaitanya Manobi Stam Stapti Tam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadati Swam Padanti Kam. So in that verse, the second part, refers to Rupa Goswami, who is the representative of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Rupa Goswami's bhakti has benefited the entire world. Where does Rupa Goswami stay? In Sri Vrindavan Dham. He doesn't travel out. But the whole world benefits because of his bhakti. As you become Krishna conscious, your bhakti will affect the entire world according to the, the, the power. Just like you see one person, it only took one person, one pure devotee to take Krishna consciousness around the world. So when one becomes advanced in devotional service and one becomes empowered by the Lord, every activity they perform is auspicious and benefits everyone. It's like it mentions that 14 generations of one's family members also get liberation if one becomes a pure devotee of the Lord. So devotional service is not relegated to time, place, and circumstances. It has an effect on all levels of existence because it's spiritual, it's not material. Material means localized or in relationship to. When you serve the Lord, you serve everyone. <laughs> Why? Because everyone is connected to the Lord. So um, best to see what you can do in devotional service. The best thing you can do in devotional service, if you want to help, then focus your attention on devotees and do work for them. There are also devotees who need some care, some attention, some guidance, something that can be offered, and that will be a greater amount of welfare work than going to material world, because whatever welfare work you do in the material world is subject to the time element. It doesn't last. It's like sometimes feeding the poor. Well, you feed the poor, and then five hours later, that same poor person is still hungry. So we do that, but we don't give them just prashadam. We, uh, food, we give them prashadam. That way, the, the feeding becomes a spiritual growth for them rather than just satisfying their hunger, need, hung, the needs of the hunger. Mm. So, yeah, it is better to stay within the context of devotional activities and perform activities there. Now, if you went to these other places and did something spiritual, that would be good. That would benefit. Mm. Such as distributing prasadam. Or mm. it's like here at Bhakti Vedanta Manor, when the manor was fully operating, many of the local schools would come and bring their students. And these were, these were children, most of them. We had one devotee, uh, I can't remember his name. Uh, I remember his brother's name. Brother's name was Rasa Mandala, and he had a twin brother who worked at the manor. I can't remember his name. Maybe somebody could remember who's out there. Uh, what was his name? We used to take care of the, he would take the classes and show them the entire Bhakti Vedanta Manor, give them activities to perform, talk to them. So many kids from so many schools. If we had, we had schools coming every day. Uh, usually the kids were like from the lower grades. And uh, 
And this devotee did this wonderful service every day, just taking care of these kids. So, yeah, they were from the secular world, but they were getting Krishna consciousness. That's the idea. Because that's the need of the time. Thank you very much. You will, you will. Anyone else has anything to share? Please go ahead. Suda. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Uh, Tanut Pranam Guru Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to you. Uh, thank you, Guru Maharaj, for the very nice class. Um, uh, so I have a question, Guru Maharaj, like uh, about like material and spiritual activities. And like uh, um, you mentioned, like, you know, don't use your senses in material gratification. Uh, you'll be disappointed. You have to use our senses for serving the Lord. But uh, I mean, sometimes we are forced to use like most of the time, like um, our senses in material gratification. Like, I don't know, maybe as... You said, Guru Maharaj, I have to read and understand the categories. Like, you know, a lot of times, like we have a house now, we have to pay the mortgage. Um, we have, we send um, kids to school and a uh, lot of times we have to donate uh, to the school uh, for some fundraising activities. So all these things, uh, which categories? They come under Guru Maharaj, like a census, sense gratification, they, or like they, uh, they, they don't fall into sense gratification. They fall into to use just to use a basic explanation. There are necessary parts of our day to day life in the material world. We are required to accomplish them, but in the most simplest and most direct way. Okay. Uh, we don't look we we don't look for happiness in them. We just do them because they're necessary. So. And our house belongs to Krishna. Our children are Krishna's parts and parts. Mm -hmm. So when you develop that consciousness in relationship to your ordinary activities, that is called gona bhakti. Mm -hmm. Gona means in relationship to. So it is also bhakti, but it is parallel because it deals with the material energy. Mm -hmm. But it's still bhakti because these things, when they're connected to Krishna, mm -hmm. As it says here, offering ordinary activities such as brushing your teeth or taking a bath. This also somewhat overlaps that same category in the sense that these are required. But when people put their full attention into these activities and try to find happiness through these things, then that sort of pollutes the whole principle of devotional service. The activities, these, these have to be done. We have to sweep, the, we have to clean the house. Otherwise, if it doesn't, you don't clean the house, it's, it remains dirty and you can't live in it. It becomes, you know, undesirable. So that you have to clean the house. It's Krishna's house. That's good. And you understand, Krishna says, uh, every, uh, he says, who is it? Everything spiritual and material comes from me. Mm. Everything spiritual and material is controlled by me. And everything spiritual and material is meant to be used in my mm. service. Okay. There's nothing material from the highest platform of consciousness. But we're not on that highest platform. But from Krishna's perspective, everything is spiritual. Because it's all coming from him. So when we engage the material into the spiritual activity, that is Krishna consciousness. Okay. I'm taking my kids to school because they are Krishna's parts and parcel. This is required. And of course, the Vedic culture teaches you to reduce your material activities as you advance in age. And then towards the end of life, 
those we practically give up all material activities and completely focus on direct spiritual activities. But in in the early parts of our life, especially with family, this is required. This is saying uh, a, necess a necessity that we have to perform. Also. But do it in the most direct and simplest way. And that way you can spend quality time in other activities which are more beneficial to your spiritual advancement. Not that we neglect these, but we don't put our full, uh, we don't, we, in other words, we don't see these things as being the source of my happiness. They're required, they're necessary. Mm -hmm. Yes, Manish, thank you so much. So do it uh, uh, as a necessary, but uh, don't seek happiness in it. Do it as if you get happiness, it'll come automatically. Mm -hmm. okay. Those who seek happiness sometimes get it and, and most of the times miss it. You want to be happy, don't try to mm -hmm. be happy. If you want to be happy, don't mm -hmm. try to be happy. That's Prahlad Maharaj's statement. He said... If you want to be happy, do one thing, stop trying to be happy, and you will be happy. Okay. Just try to serve, and happiness will come by your service. Okay, so uh, it should come naturally, don't try to be happy, so. We want to be happy, but there's a way to become happy, and it's not by trying to be happy. Mm -hmm. Yes, good much, I got it. So now that to happy but don't try to be happy it should come naturally by it service. will come naturally it's not should it will it will come automatically <laughs> the problem is we keep we keep thinking well this is going to make me happy and this is not going to make me happy so i'll do this and i won't do this and that's mm -hmm. material and it keeps us always on on the, the platform of accepting and rejecting just serve the Lord, engage in devotional service, and you will be happy. <laughs> yes, good. Write, write that down. <laughs> you will be if I if I serve the Lord, I will be happy. It's 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 an absolute principle. It's not a relative principle. <laughs> Yes, Guruvaj. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. How? Uh, one more question, Guruvaj. That I think you mentioned here. I put it somewhere. Like um, sometimes, like uh, performing devotion service, also we find it very hard uh, because we are juggling with the material duties also, and we give like priority to material duties. Uh, so much like uh, just my personal experience. Um, uh, I'm trying to engage, like, you know, doing aati and reading and all these things. In this process, also, sometimes I feel like um, I'm neglecting, like, you know, especially like it comes to kids, like uh, school emails or anything. I try to miss a lot of uh, things. Um, so how should I balance um, pretty much? Like you mentioned, that's, like... That's, everyone, uh, has that, everyone has that, that dilemma, how to balance their material with their spiritual. It's a dilemma that you will always find. It's something you have to work with and learn how to use your time in the best possible way. That comes from trial and error, from understanding, from experience. Okay. So yeah. to practice. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's something you learn. Mm -hmm. That's good much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, sorry, it's okay. I have but one I can, last. I can also give you a little tip. Uh, write mm -hmm. down every day, either the first thing you do in the morning, or the, the first thing you do in the morning is the best time. But you can also do it the night before. Mm -hmm. Just write down your schedule for the day. Okay. To sit there and write your whole schedule for the day before you perform those activities. And then you can balance your time like that. You can adjust what you wrote write down also, but if you have some working schedule, then you know I'll be using my time in this way at this time. 
They become more efficient. This is a practical thing that works both in spiritual life and particularly in material life. People study this whole science, how to get the, the maximum efficiency out of the time available. Mm -hmm. It's a science, actually. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's books written about it. And that's the whole seminar in itself. And I could, if I begin talking about it, we'll, we might not end for another hour, but because it is, a, it is a way to approach life in the most practical way. Yes, yeah, write down, you just write down your schedule. Yes, Kurmaj, I'll do that. I'll practice that. I really need to learn in that. <laughs> yeah, thank Each you. day yeah. you do it because maybe some days are different than others. <laughs> you write yes. down the activity and the times you're going to perform that activity. In. Yes, Kurmaj, thank you. It's Very fun. Much. You have a lot of fun doing that. Yes, yes, very much. And right now I'm juggling with that. Um, yeah, definitely. I'll, I'll try to apply your instructions. Yeah. Thank you. Krishna consciousness is enjoyable when you're, when you're eager to do it. When you're not eager to do it, it becomes difficult. Okay, yeah. When I'm eager, it will be easy. When I'm not eager, it will be difficult. <laughs> so, exactly. You have to learn to be eager. And uh, thank you very much. And you practice becoming eager, and then that eagerness will turn into a, a strong desire for, for the activity. Mm, yes, yes, good one. So, yeah. So when you have ego, it will turn to strong desire, and then yeah, you. that's the that's the that's the re, more or less the definition of how eagerness manifests. That you know, I want to serve. I look forward to serve. Just like we say, mm -hmm. uh, I get to serve. I love to serve. I want to serve. You can write that down. I get to serve. I want to serve. I love to serve. It's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. That's true for the soul. It may not be true for the mind, but then you have to make the mind your friend. Yes, Guru Maharaj. That's I have to really learn. I have to make my mind friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Practice. Yes, yes. Yes, good much. Thank you so much for all the practical tips, definitely. To apply. No more questions I can ask in the end. I want to just give. Thank you. Thank you, Krishna. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. That was very useful for me too. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. <laughs> yes, devotees, anyone else has anything to ask or share? Please go ahead. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. And then with pranam to you, Maharaj. Can you hear my voice, Maharaj? Very nice. Oh, thank you. Uh, so my question was, uh, many times I have uh, read in the purports of uh, Prabhupada uh, about the liberation. And uh, I find somewhere i find it in a difficult meaning uh, in uh, sorry in a different meaning and somewhere i find it in the form of 
uh, what you call liberation as moksha. So I want to know that uh, is the liberated, uh, uh, you know, uh, when we say we, uh, a person is liberated and it goes uh, to spiritual abode, is that uh, bo both the things same or there's a difference in that? Um, there is a difference. There are, to get right down to the essence, there are five kinds of liberations. And that's mentioned in Bhagavatam. Samipya, Salokya, Sarupya, Sharsti, and Sahujya. Samipya means the same bodily features as Krishna. No, no I'm sorry. Samipya, I'm not sure of Samipya. Salokya means to, to go to the same planet where Krishna is in the material world and associate with him in his activities. Sarupya means the same bodily form as the Lord. Sharsti means the same material opulences as the Lord. Samipya, if somebody remember, can remember what Samipya is, I can't. And the last one is Sahuja. Sahuja, we don't, the devotees don't at all desire Sahuja, means to merge into the bodily effulgence of the Lord or to merge into the body of the Lord. That's, that's impersonal liberation. The other four are personal and they can come by way of devotional service. Mm -hmm. So these four are desirable. And according to how one executes one's devotional service and consciousness at the time of death, they may achieve a particular type of liberation. So these are the four varieties that are recommended or acceptable for devotees. Samipya to be a personal associate of the Lord. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we are not, uh, we don't want to go to the uh, Sayujya liberation. Is that correct, Maharaj? That's impersonal. And that's, that's impersonal. That's also, you fall down from that after and you come back to the material world. So Maharaj, at many times, uh, Prabhupada has used the word liberation. How do we understand that? Uh, yeah. You have to understand that in the context he's using it. Because he'll use it in different contexts depending on what he's trying to, uh, you know, communicate. Um, another example of the word liberation means freedom from all material desires. That's That word liberation applies to that also. The jnanis can get liberation, the yogis can get liberation, and the devotees get liberation, different kinds of liberation. Okay. Uh, Maharaj, can I refer to one purport? And, uh, you know, uh, there's one uh, in Canto 1, um, Chapter 13. It's okay. But I think you should. I think you should note that I answered your question completely already. If you just think oh, about, yes. you, if you think about the answers I gave you, you will find that everything is there. There's nothing. If you want to try to find another answer, you might find yourself getting confused. Okay. But if you, yes, if you, if you want to make if you want to make that statement, I'll answer it. But it falls within the context of whatever 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 I said so far, because okay. it can be used in different ways. Okay. So oh. go ahead, read your statement. Okay, uh, it is in one thirteen fifty nine when uh, Vidura is uh, saying that he is astonished 
to see his brother Dhritarashtra leaving as a liberated yogi. Yeah, it means he's free from all material desires, that's all. Okay, so here it is uh, just the liberation of uh, uh, body and mind and all that. Is it like that? Well, it's still, it's, uh, it's again, it's impersonal liberation. Hmm. Okay. When you speak about yogis, of course, there's bhakti yogis too, but those fall into those four categories we mentioned. Within those five categories, all liberations are there. There's five categories of liberation. They're all in those five we mentioned. So Maharaj, I was a little confused because in the same purport, uh, Prabhupada has mentioned that the trust only attain liberation and after many such liberated life, one attains devotional service. Yeah. Mm, okay. There are different levels of practice of spirituality. One, they're called Atmaramas, or those who are fixed in in uh, spiritual activities, but they don't take up devotional service. They're yogis, they're jnanis. Our liberation is to is to perform activities for the for the pleasure of the Lord and offer it to the Lord. The yogis and jnanis stop all material activities and simply perform worship by doing various types of ceremonies, various types of pujas, study of the scriptures, like that. There are various types of spiritualists who attain liberation, but most of, mostly all of that liberation is Sahuja Mukti. As Lord Brahma says, Aruna Krishchena Padam Padam Padanti Yada Nadritya Usma Ahangrayaha. He says these people they they go very high on the spiritual platform, but then again, Padantiyada they fall down. Why? Because they are not engaged in devotional service. So Prabhupada would say, devotional service automatically includes liberation. When you're engaged in devotional service, you are on the liberated platform. Try to remember that. When you're engaged in devotional service, you are on the liberated platform. Because devotional service is not part of this material world. It is bhakti. It is, it is known as, it's coming from Srimati Radharani. It's bhakti Devi. It has nothing to do with this world at all. Although the activities look like material activities, they are not because they are in relationship to the Supreme Lord. So when you're engaged in devotional service, you are on the liberated platform. And when you free yourself from all material desires, you have reached liberation. Okay, Maharaj. Thank you. I think that clarifies. Yes. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. please go ahead. Thank you, Mataji. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, Guru Maharaj, today class was like full of so much nectar, I would say one after another, so many learnings. One very uh, good things I learned today is that, uh, and there is a related question that uh, whatever activities we are doing, even including cleaning, that can be also like that cannot be like that's also a devotional service. If we think that everything belongs to like Krishna and we are just so my point here is that um, this can only happen when we continuously meditate that everything is belonging to Krishna and whatever we have has to be continuously and every time used in service of Lord and his devotee. Yeah, Krishna says, one who sees me and everything and everything in me, I am never, I'm never, never lost and he is never lost to me. 
when you see everything in relationship to Krishna, that is pure, that is proper consciousness. That is clear consciousness. And when you connect everything to Krishna, that is Krishna consciousness. The flower, you see a flower and you think, oh, what a beautiful flower. But then again, you think, oh, that flower is so nicely arranged. Look at the artistic the contours and the, the beautiful colors and the smells. So who's the artist that, that created that flower? Prabhupada did that. There was one really highly qualified architect devotee at New Vrindavan. Prabhupada called him and he was sitting with Prabhupada. Prabhupada had a rose and Prabhupada was playing with the rose, moving it around in his hand. And finally he handed to the devotee, he said, can you make that? <laughs> of course the devotee said, no, I can't make that. And Krishna is the supreme architect, the supreme Supreme artist. Krishna can produce material bodies that continually produce other material bodies. We can produce a material body by having children, but can we produce a material body that can teach? that will continue to have material bodies. That's Krishna. <laughs> he puts everything in motion. He is the architect. He is the engineer. He is the artist. He is the developer. <laughs> he is the perfect craftsmanship. When you see something in this world that looks ugly, it means that we have we messed around with it and made it ugly, that's all. But from Krishna's perspective, when he creates, everything is beautiful and everything is a reflection of his energy, which is non different than him. Seeing everything in relationship to Krishna, even the things we manufacture, just like Prabhupada said, we manufacture some bricks. So what does it take to make, make a brick? Now, bricks make houses. So the houses come from bricks. So we take some dirt and we add some water to it. We put it in some fire, we bake it and we have a brick. So earth, water and fire together, you have bricks. Bricks make houses. So the basic ingredients are coming from Krishna. Krishna says, Bhumir Apanalo Bayu, Kamana Bhudi Evacha. Ahankar itiyame bina prakriti astada. All the ingredients that make up the existence in this material world are coming from him directly. No one can produce the basic ingredients, but we take the basic ingredients and we reformulate it and make our houses, our computers, our plastic bottles, <laughs> you know, our, our furniture, whatever we make. It's all his energy. That's all it is. So you might say the living entity is a secondary creator. But without the ingredients, we can't do anything. And those ingredients come from him. But even in nature itself, when you look at nature in its purest form, such as beautiful gardens or forests like that, you'll see the pure hand of Krishna in its artistic expression. And it's all, not only is it, work, not only is it every, so artistic, it works in a certain way that everything connected to each other has a certain symmetry about it that supports its, each other. All life supports all other life. And Krishna has created this whole beautiful pattern of how the interaction of life supports more life and continues to propagate life. So we've made some computers, which are quite ingenious, you might say, <clears throat> but Krishna is the supreme, you know, ITT master, I mean, <laughs> IIT master. <laughs> so yeah, so when we develop that kind of consciousness, then we're never outside of Krishna. Everything is connected to him. 
And that way we treat everything as being sacred in the sense that we don't waste anything and we don't misuse anything and we don't accumulate excess things that we, you know, we can't have, we don't have any use for. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. I think the earth is his workshop. <laughs> yes. You're wearing some nice glasses, but the ingredients came from Krishna. <laughs> Those headphones. It's a normal glass, awesome. Guru Maharaj. <laughs> just, <laughs> it's just uh, that uh, <laughs> this layer, I don't know what's called um, in the sun, like it. Like because of my eyes, they gave this a special class. They said that it's just so <laughs> Prabhupada was walking with uh, with one big industrialist on a morning walk. And so Prabhupada was just being introduced to him. So he asked the man, What is your what do you do? He said, I'm a glass maker. And Prabhupada said, Well, what is the ingredients that that are from glass and the man said sand and Prabhupada said well then uh, sand belongs to Krishna so you're stealing from Krishna <laughs> and then the man said well I do give in charity and Prabhupada said all right you're just a small thief then So I'm looking through a window here, and the window's protecting me from the external environment. At least it's blocking me from it. But that way, that glass is made from sand in, in a certain way, and the ingredients that make it up comes from Krishna. <laughs> Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Lalitangi Mataji, please go ahead. Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, please accept my respectful obeisances. Uh, all glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to your grace Maharaj. Thank you so much for your wonderful, I mean, soul satisfying association. Um, Maharaj, this, hey. this is a I uh, thank you for your nice words, but I don't believe you anyway. <laughs> the thing is, uh, it's like this: we are uh, my. I have a pot which has a hole, so even if you keep filling nectar every day, it keeps draining. <laughs> but you're so merciful; you keep coming again and again. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, this is a question uh, about um, uh, the passing away of uh, Janki Nath Prabhu. Uh, of course, I was not personally very much connected to him, but uh, I kept praying for him. Uh, even when you come, I used to ask to you about him. And then we saw him in the Zoom video just two days before he passed away. Uh, yeah, we understand that Krishna... Krishna has ultimately uh, done this, so this is this is the ultimate good for him. Um, but there is, uh, you know, conversations in the mind going on. So so much suffering he has to undergo. Uh, he gave himself uh, for the Lord service, and then he says that, uh, you know, the Lord says that Mame kam sharanam vraja aham tvam sarva pape bio moksha ishyami masuchaha. Uh, and uh, some things like this and also you know he's such a such a glorious um, gem for the movement so compassionate uh, such a jolly person who if he was here he would have touched many many souls and uh, brought them to krishna consciousness uh, so all these things i'm not able to i mean and also missing him so if you can help me with this uh, mixed uh, feelings uh, maharaj well, I can say that during the ceremonies for his departure, and, and which was after or many, there, there was always a very joyful feeling amongst everyone, even the family members. And I, that feeling was quite constant amongst everyone. 
that it wasn't a sad thing because I think everyone felt that he had, had achieved something very wonderful, the association of the Lord. Um, <laughs> there's a story, I forget who it was, one great personality. I think it was Jamuna Charya. You're from South India, right? Yeah. So you know the, you know, Jamuna Charya, right? Yeah, yes, Maharaj. Yeah. So Jamuna Charya, I think, was leaving the body. And some of his uh, followers were mourning his an inevitable departure. And he just turned to them. He said, I should be mourning for you because you have to stay in this material world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes sense, Maharaj. <laughs> so we still don't have enough faith to come to that realization that there's something better than, <laughs> than what we have right now. <laughs> mm. And it's true. Life in this world is a struggle. But in this, when you reach spiritual consciousness and you get a spiritual body, then there is variety, <laughs> there is adventure, <laughs> there's all the things that we think that are so important in this world that gives us happiness. It's all there in the spiritual realm too. But the inebriates that come with the material energy are absent. I mean, Krishna, you know, Krishna has to hide from the gopis and tell her boys they fight with him. They take his lunch. They play tricks on him. So there's all kinds of intrigue and mysterious things going on, even in the spiritual world. But there's an element of joy that permeates the whole thing. <laughs> Where here it's an element of, <laughs> I hope it works out according to my plans. <laughs> right, Maharaj, yeah. Sometimes it feels that he just only had 36 years to complete his journey. And he came and he made a lasting impression in many people's hearts. I was listening to his uh, uh, eulogies also. Uh, three days uh, they did it from Pandav Sena and other devotees. It was so moving to see that uh, he was such a, a vibrant, pure uh, devotee. Well, let me see if I can... Fine. Something I'll read to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll read this. <laughs> Shivaram Maharaj's reply to my email about Janaki Nath Prabhu. This is from Shivaram Maharaj. Thank you for that. It was a pleasure to read. I didn't know him, but recognize his face. You can trust your feelings of the final event. Krishna comes for his devotees, no doubt. I'm envious of him. <laughs> Obviously, he had limited karma to work off and his service for Prabhupada was completed. Although devotees never think like that. Thank you for writing. Wow, so nice, Maharaj. He says I'm envious. <laughs> what he's saying is he went back home and I have to stay here. <laughs> always stay in the pure service of, the service of pure devotees and that way you'll always be protected in spiritual life. That was the last line he wrote. Thank nice. you so much, Maharaj. 
when you hear from great souls and everything becomes clear. Yeah. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Maybe I'll come and see you. I don't know. I'm going to try. But let's see. Oh, that will be wonderful, Maharaj, in Toronto. We can have your program. Oh, you're in Toronto now. Oh, you escaped from the U.S. Okay. <laughs> I'm, going to the, I'm going to the U.S. In, in maybe in a few weeks, in about a oh, month. We missed that. So uh, you're coming to Boston? Uh, or... mm, that's not on the list, but maybe North Carolina. Oh, wow. Let's, let's, see, let's see what happens. I wish they could uh, do the your classes on Zoom, Maharaj, so at least others can attend. <laughs> okay. My obeisances to you and to, your, you. to your family of wonderful kirtaniers. <laughs> We are all made by your drop of your blessings, Maharaj. Please, uh, no obeisances. It's like Abhiram Thak, Abhiram Thakur offering obeisances to crack the fake shalagrams. <laughs> so we are all fake, but we want to. We want your blessings so that we can. We don't remain fake. <laughs> we, we don't want to explode, Maharaj. <laughs> If I, if I pay my obeisances to you, you'll still be there. <laughs> no, Maharaj, not at all. We'll simply explode. Haribo. <laughs> I have a question for you. Can I ask you a question? Are you familiar with Hanuman Chalisa? Maharaj, yeah. You are. Do you know what meter it's chanted in? How to chant that, the, the prayers, the, the particular meter for chanting? Uh, there is one meter that uh, is there in the south, but I'm not sure exactly what's the meter that it is done. Um, maybe I can I can ask uh, some uh, music that uh, who's in... Carnatic field and I can get back to you, Maharaj. What you can do is you can sing it for me and send it on some, you know, some tape or something. I want to learn, I have the book and I want to learn the, the, the meter for chanting it, but I don't have any idea how, to, how it goes. Uh, yes, Maharaj, I will, uh, I can do that and uh, send you, Maharaj. Uh, maybe Thank I can you. get a better devotee to sing. I'll try that, Mother. Okay. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, uh, do you have time? Actually, Manasi Mataji had raised hand. I don't wish. Okay, yeah, I'd like to ask question. Um, if Maharaj has time. Yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Thank you for the um, wonderful salad today. That was nice. Thank you. <laughs> you are very merciful, Maharaj. I can't express my gratitude. Every time very somebody great. makes me a salad, they always mess it up. But mm -hmm. You did it nicely today. I couldn't believe it. I was thinking I got lucky today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are very merciful. No, I'm just <laughs> telling the truth. I'm, the truth sounds like mercy, but it's just the truth. That's it. <laughs> I'll make sure that I send it the same way next time. <laughs> <laughs> You're on. That's going to be recorded. So it's, you're on. You're on. <laughs> I didn't send any dressing, though. I don't know if Risha Prabhu has, you know, um, done any magic to the simple salad. Uh, there was no added magic needed. It was. It was good. <laughs> 
Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Maraj. Um, so Maraj, I really um, admire and just love the verses you always pick up. And today was again, Nectar, I, I came online after a few days and today's verse was also excellent. It always provokes that deep introspection after reading those verses with you. Um, I have a question that in the, in the translation said yeah. that um, Lord is pleased when we serve the devotees. And then in the purport also Prabhupada said that serving pure devotees is more important or more um, uh, Krishna Very likes precious. it more mm -hmm. than yeah. the service to himself. So in practical life, many times we get to serve devotees uh, and we, we also are serving in the temple. Sometimes I'm not initiated yet, so I'm not doing any deity worship. But I have seen many um, devotee friends and myself also in that kind of situation, similar situation that there is a dilemma that when we get to serve some devotees, um, but we have our regular service and we want to try and accommodate, but we can't. And then we have to choose which one to go for. It's a great dilemma because serving the devotees is not always possible. So what should be our decision based on? Well, what's the most needed at the time? Mm. Yeah, I think you have to see what's the most needed at the time that these apparent dilemmas come up. So we shouldn't a, rely on our desire. Well, the desire may be in line with with the right thing, but it may not be. You have to see what's needed. Sometimes if you neglect something that needs to be done and in, in favor of something you like to do, and later on you regret it because that thing was required at that particular time. Um, I think that's just a practical consideration what's more important right now mm. and that you have to determine and we get some we get a little bit of understanding by our past experiences but then we also can see can this wait in favor of this or should this be done first mm. Uh, life works in such a way as that in the material sense, if you make the wrong sense, the judgment, you, you know, you really regret it or something goes wrong or something happens. When it comes to spiritual life, if there's, there's a dilemma about how to serve and you apparently choose the thing that seems to be more your personal desire, there's no loss there because it's spiritual. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and um, I really appreciate the clarification that you gave about Jankinath Prabhu because I have also had the same kind of um, emotions, sometimes overwhelmed with emotions. And I remember reading one story from uh, Ramanuja Sampradai. I don't remember the name of that devotee, but he was physically so much tortured by the kings at that time. His Quresh. eyes were Quresh, Quresh, and there was somebody else as well with Quresh. Yes, yes, Quresh. Yeah, and then there was the elderly guru Yes. Ramanuja Charya. It was named, well, it starts with an M. Mm. Uh, what was his name? Mon. Can't remember. He was accompanying Goresh Koresh, when they went to see the 
King Kolatunga. Yes. Uh, Man, Man Muni, Man Muni, or something like that. Something Muni. His name yes, was I, something. I have Muni. it in my notes, uh, yeah. but I don't remember. He was elderly. He was elderly. But he died. Yes. They were tortured. Well, their eyes were plucked, plucked out. out. Yeah. yeah. By uh, this terrible king, Kolatanga. Mm. But then uh, Amanuja restored Koresh's eyes. And when he brought him in front of Bhartaraj, and he asked, he told Koresh, you know, ask Bhartaraj for your eyes back. <laughs> Bhartaraj and Koresh sat in front of the deity and didn't say anything. And then the deity spoke to him and said, you've come. And he said, and then all he said was, please forgive Kolatanga. Please give him your mercy. He was just trying to give mercy to his torturers. Mm. And then he left and Koresh came back. And then Ramanujacharya could see he didn't ask him. <clears throat> so he knew that Koresh was so humble that he wasn't going to ask the deity for anything for himself. So Ramanujacharya tricked him and said, all right, those eyes belong to me because you're my disciple. And therefore you go to uh, Bhartaraj and you say, I've lost something that belongs to my spiritual master. <laughs> That was, that was Ramanujacharya's trick. And, <laughs> and then his eyes were restored by Bhartaraj. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Koresh, Koresh is such a powerful devotee. He's a great soul. There's, there's actually a, a temple of Koresh somewhere in the south. I'm not sure where. He's really glorified. His devotion is... So it's so hard to understand. It's beyond completely selfless. Kuresh is the same devotee who whom Ramanujacharya saw with that lady, right, Maharaj? First time. No, that was okay. That was uh, name started with a B. Hmm. We got when when that man that when he came with his wife, he kept looking at her, her yeah. eyes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I forgot. So that is not was. Kuresh. Okay. No, no, no. Kuresh was already there. Hmm. Mahapurna was the one that Mahapurna. Kuresh. Yeah. Uh, yes. Him. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Mahapurna. Mm -hmm. so Maharaj, this story, since I have read this story many times, <laughs> this question used to come and it, it just emotionally used to um, make me very anxious thinking that I just cannot understand why would, what example Krishna wants to set by giving physical torture. Somehow I'm very sensitive to the physical tortures. Um, that's what I have noticed in myself. But today you gave such a profound answer by saying that we are, I'm not at the level or that I can realize why Krishna does this kind of pastimes through his uh, to bring out To bring out the glories of these devotees. Mm -hmm. mm knowing that no matter what happens to them, they will never lose their devotion. They will only increase their devotion. <laughs> they put Prahlad and Maharaj in so many difficult situations. But of course, Prahlad was unharmed, but still he was threatened in so many ways. But Krishna protected him. Same with Srila Haridas Thakur when he was beaten in 23 marketplaces. 
But in some cases, it appears that there's some suffering undergone by the devotee. But Prabhupada says a devotee never undergoes suffering. He may undergo some difficulty. But suffering is due to attachment, material attachment. Those who have no material attachments don't suffer, but they may experience difficulties. Mm -hmm. The non-devotees suffer because that's what they live for. We don't live to maintain the body. We live to purify the soul so we can go back to Godhead. Don't worry, Krishna. Don't worry, Krishna will not test you beyond your level. <laughs> so, Maharaj, from what you have said, um, it's just another question has come up in my mind. One, 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 uh, one minute, Mansi. Yes. Uh, Shamla, I'll be right with you. I'm just outside the front door, sir. So I'm finishing, I'm my, I'm finishing my, my class. I'll be right with you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Okay. Sorry. Maharaj, we can continue tomorrow. I can ask follow-up question tomorrow. No, it's okay. Just fin we can... Um, so... From what you said that, um, yes, so I um, sometimes with my own problems also, I, I, I have this dual feelings that materially I feel pinched. But then when I see myself spiritually, I can clearly see that Krishna is protecting me by giving me that material pinch, by giving me that material discomfort. He's actually giving me that space, that um, circumstances, favorable circumstances where I can go ahead in Krishna consciousness. So is that material pinch suffering or just an experience? It's, it's, it's a learning experience. Mm. Mm. You can learn from that. Mm. We learn that that little pinch is just saying, you know, you don't, you don't need this <laughs> due to our material attachments. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank Krishna's you. So all, much. Krishna's all good. Don't worry. <laughs> Whatever he does. He does may he may allow certain things to go on and it seems to be unpleasant, but in the long run, it's just to bring his devotee back to him. That's what. Mm. <laughs> when you get back to the spiritual world, you think, boy, that was a bad dream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so that's that will be the experience of the soul returning to the spiritual. They look at their their surgeon in the material world is simply a bad dream. That's it. Thank you so much for the clarification and the reinforcement. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Krishna. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Okay, Varunda. Yes, Maharaj. Uh I know it's late, but Lavanya Mataji has raised hand. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances and wish to Srila Prabhupada. Um, and I don't have any question, Guru Maharaj. Um, just um, want to say that uh, very nice class and thank you for, um, for the nice class, Guru Maharaj. And uh, today uh, we need your blessings. Uh, today is our son's uh, birthday. So just want to um, ask your blessings, Guru Maharaj. Um, Siddharth. Hare, Hare okay. well. Best wishes on your birthday. Uh, thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Now, so now you, are you, how many rounds are you chanting? Uh, I want to increase it to six, Maharaj. Now how many are doing? And now I'm doing six. How many? Now are, he is doing four rounds. Four rounds, Maharaj, but uh, after today, uh, like from today, I want to start doing six, Maharaj. 
Good, good. That's a good birthday present. <laughs> I was going to recommend that, but you beat me. <laughs> good. Perhaps I'll see you soon. <laughs> yes, yeah, yes, ma'am. <laughs> good. You look like a very fine young man. <laughs> uh, thank you, Maharaj. <laughs> He's 15 today, Guru Maharaj. 15 years old. Good. Good. <laughs> thank you, Guru Maharaj. Good. Best wishes on your birthday. And uh, when I see you, I'll bring you a birthday present. <laughs> uh, thank you, Maharaj. You coming is <laughs> a birthday present, Maharaj. <laughs> It'll be a little late, but uh, it'll still be a present. <laughs> Maharaj, you coming here, Maharaj, is, your, is the birthday present that I want, Maharaj. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Did, did Radha Bhakti contact you? Yes, Guru Maharaj. Yeah, yeah. We are in that process. Guru yes, Guru Maharaj, actually. Yeah. Okay. I'll just wait for the results. <laughs> yes, Guru Maharaj. <laughs> Thank you. Best wishes. What is your name? <laughs> Uh, Siddharth Maharaj. Siddharth, beautiful name. Such a beautiful name. Thank you. Thank you. Hare Krishna. My obeisances to the whole family. May you have best wishes on your birthday and in all the other birthdays to come. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, all devotees. Thank you so much. I give your blessings to Siddharth. Hare Krishna. Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. That was a beautiful nectary in class today. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your time and association. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Glories to Prabhupada. We'll see you all tomorrow. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. 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 Thank you, Maharaj. Thank Hare you very Krishna. much. Thank you very much, Gurudev. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj.